Good morning, church. Um, it's really good to see all of you today. And we thank God for giving us such a lovely day. It's very nice and sunny outside. We thank him for his goodness. Before we start church service, I want to read um, a scripture with you. So if you've got your Bible, could you please open to Psalm 108? And I'm going to read with you from verse 1 to 6. Psalm 108, verses 1 to 6. The Bible says, my heart is confident in you, O God. No wonder I can sing your praises with all my heart. Wake up, liar, and harp. I will wake the dawn with my song. I will thank you, Lord, among all the people. I will sing your praises among the nations, for your unfailing love is higher than the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the highest heavens. Verse 5. May your glory shine over all the earth. Verse 6. Now rescue your beloved people. Answer and save us by your power. We thank God so much for today. And as the Bible says, I've just read from verse 1 of 106. It says that my heart is confident in you, O Lord. And it is a new morning, we get the chance to meet God again, we get the chance to gather together, and we should be confident that God is with us, his spirit is with us, and we should come with an expectant heart. You know, the Bible says something in Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, that where two or three are gathered together in his name. Now, it doesn't say we should be together physically, but we are gathered together in his name. So we are on Zoom but we are gathered together in the name of Jesus. He is here with us. So God is with us, and I want us to all come today with an expectant heart that God will reach us and God will bless us. So um, you're welcome again, and I'm going to hand it over to Joe and Gemma, who are going to give us a time of worship. So let's join with them to really worship God and sing and reach out to God today. You get the words, the subtitles as usual, so enable them and, and, and enjoy the service. So over to you, Joanne Gemma. Thank you, Lawrence. It's great to be here today, church, as we worship to God together. And we're going to be singing a song called Indescribable, and it talks about how powerful and how amazing God is. So, Lord, we just thank you for today. We welcome you here, Lord. I pray that we would worship you today in spirit and in truth, mm -hmm. Lord, as we sing these songs to praise you, Jesus. Mm. Thank you, Lord. From the highest of heights to the depths of the sea, all creations revealing your majesty. From the colors of the 
us, Lord, to love us, Lord. Fill us with your love, Lord. Yes, Lord, you help us to love others like you love others, Lord. Would we receive the love of Jesus, the love of the Father every day, Lord, so we can love others, so we can be a difference in this world. Thank you, your love, it's unshakable. It's a firm foundation, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh man, I'll pass over to Lawrence. Thank you very much, and Gemma, for that. Um, I, I really want to encourage each one of us today to um, just be ready to pray because at this time, I want us to really think about what we've been doing and the worship that we've sung. And, and the verse that I, I read today at the start of the service, um, Psalm 108, verse 2 to 3, I'll read that again. It says, wake up, Lyle and harp. I will wake the I will wake the dawn with my song, and I will thank you, Lord, among all the people. I will sing your praises among the nations. And at this time, I want you to unmute your mic, and I want us to pray and just thank God for His goodness. Thank God for, Amen. Okay, so um, now we come to the kids um session. So Joy is going to lead us um with, with the kids session, and there's going to be something very interesting. So over to you, Joy. Oh, hello, Frank. What are you doing? Hello. I'm just getting the Sunday school uh, activity done. Wow, that looks beautiful. Yes, I've been working really hard on it for a very long time. Wow, can I have a look? Oh, oh, you've torn it. Oh, oh, so sorry, Frank. I didn't mean to do that. Oh, 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 how would you like it if I went and ripped what you were doing? I didn't mean to do it. I'm so sorry. Hmm. Do you know, it's not true. I didn't really rip. Frank's Sunday school activity and he is just a puppet. I wonder if you can tell from that little scene what we are learning about today. We are learning about forgiveness. Jesus taught us about forgiveness when he taught us the Lord's Prayer. He showed us how we could pray for ourselves. Okay, and he said, when you pray, he said the Lord's Prayer, and one of the lines that we pray to our Heavenly Father is for Father God, we pray, Father God, forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. So Jesus said that we can pray that prayer for forgiveness and at the same time, have clear consciences that we've forgiven other people for the wrong things they've done to us. And he said in Matthew chapter 6 verses 14 to 15, if you forgive people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their if you do not forgive people their sins, your heavenly Father will not forgive you your sins. Now we have a memory verse to help us um, remember this. And the memory verse is from Ephesians chapter 4, 32. And I will be putting that in the chat if it isn't there already. It says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. And on the other side, there's some coloured paper, which you could use coloured felt tips to make it beautifully colourful. And this reminds us that when we forgive others, we let God's life and love into our hearts. And the other 
way of craft that you could do if you have some sticky paper sticky tape some cello tape and some tissue paper you can cut out one long strand and one shorter strand to make a cross the sticky side up on a hard surface and stick tissue paper to it and then when you've covered it all in sticky in tissue paper put some sticky tape on top of it to seal it and then you can have a lovely window decoration to go on your window and that can remind you if someone does something to hurt you something wrong and you feel angry and frustrated you can go to this cross or remember Jesus cross and remember what Jesus has done for you and that helps you to realize you need to forgive and will help you forgive others it's not easy forgiving so I thought we'd say a prayer together to ask God to help us to forgive because with God's help and if we remember all that Jesus has done for us it becomes a lot easier so here's a prayer if you put your hands together and close your eyes you can say this out loud with me or quietly in your mind dear father God thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross so that we can have our sins forgiven Thank you for, give it, for forgiving my sins. Please help me to forgive others as you forgive us. In Jesus' name, Amen. Now, Jesus told a parable, a parable to help us understand how he expects us and why he expects us to forgive others when they sin against us. So this is the parable that Jesus told. A parable is a story about earthly things that has a heavenly message. So Peter was talking to Jesus and asked him, how many times is a person expected to forgive someone that keeps sinning against him? Peter asked, did he have to forgive up to seven times? And Jesus told Peter, not only does God want us to forgive someone seven times, he expects us to forgive that person 70 times seven. That's a large number. We're always expected to be forgiving. God doesn't want us to keep a book to keep track of the wrong things people do against us. He wants us to love others, have compassion and forgive. It's not always easy. Sometimes it's very hard. Jesus told this parable. He said the kingdom of heaven is like this king. The king wanted to balance the accounts with his servants and while the king was looking at the accounts he found one of the people that was brought to him owed 10,000 talents. That's 60 million denarius. But the servant couldn't afford to repay the king the 60 million denarius the servant was told that he was to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had would have to be sold to repay that payment the servant fell to his knees and begged his master to have patience with him just have patience with me and i will find a way to repay the 60 million denarius that i owe you now the master was so full of compassion for the servant that he told him I forgive you of your debt and you do not have to repay me the 60,000 denarius. But then that same servant who was forgiven his debt went to another servant that owed him 100 denarii. That's a form of money. Now, this servant owed him 100 denarii, but he had owed his master 60 million denarii. The man that was just forgiven his debt grabbed this servant that owed him money and took him by the throat. He told him 
that he had to repay the hundred denarii that was owed. The man fell down at his feet and begged him to have patience. He said, I will pay you back the whole 100 denarii that I owe you. But the servant wouldn't give him another chance to repay the money. He put the man in prison and the man had to stay in prison until he could repay the 100 denarii. When the other servants heard about what this man had done, they were very upset. They went to their master and told him what the servant had done. The master called for the servant and was very angry. He told the servant, you are an evil, sinful man. I forgave you all of your debt. It was a lot of money. You begged me to remove the debt because you could not repay it. And I did forgive the debt. And shouldn't you have had the same compassion for others, just like I had for you? The master was so angry, he sent the servant to prison to be tortured until he could repay all the money he owed. Now Jesus finished the parable by saying this. God expects us to forgive others from the heart and really mean it. Because if we don't, then he won't forgive us of the things that we do wrong. Now Jesus has shown his forgiveness on the cross. He died for our sins. He took the punishment for all the bad things that we've done. And we enjoy his love. It's a wonderful, wonderful love. We're going to sing about it when we sing the song, I'm special because God has loved me. He gave the best thing that he had to save me. His own son, Jesus, crucified to pay the debt for all the bad things I have done. So well, let's remember all that Jesus has done for us, all the wrong things he's forgiven us. And that helps us to know that we can forgive other people when they do wrong for us and it, when they do wrong to us. And it brings love and life and joy and peace and healthiness to our hearts and gets rid of bitterness and life is so much more pleasant when we all forgive each other quickly so enjoy doing the crafts and please join please have them ready to show and share at the end of the service whichever one you choose have them ready to show and share at the end of the service and see if you can remember the memory verse as well um, just to yourself and we look forward to seeing what you do we're so encouraged it will be really encouraging to see lots god bless you bye bye Thank you very much, Joy, for that. And I think the kids have quite a lot of interesting things to do between now and when David finishes the preaching. So please do them and then you get the chance to show them um, at the end of the service. Okay, David, are you around?
I think I've seen you somewhere, David. Yes, I'm here, Lawrence. You are. How are you, David? I'm very, very well because of the beautiful weather. I'm really enjoying just getting out in the sunshine, Lawrence. Great. That's good to hear. Okay, so I'm going to pray with you, David, and then I'll hand over to you. I think we still continue with the Beatitudes, right? That's right. Seven on the mount. Seven on the mount. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. So should we pray? I'll pray with you, David, and then um, I'll hand over to you. Father, I thank you so much for my brother, David, and I pray that as he speaks to us, your spirit will direct him. You will speak to us through David today in Jesus' name. Amen. Over to you, Mr. Locke. Okay, thank you, Lawrence. God bless you. Well, morning, everybody. It's just lovely to see your faces uh, on the screen and uh, just to see you. And can I also say, if you are visiting Ridgeway today for the first time, um, I'm just conscious, normally in a service, we'd catch up with you afterwards. Um, but just to say, please make yourself known if you want a message, Lawrence, myself, uh, Chris, any of the elders or the church office, we just want to make sure we catch up with you afterwards. So lovely to see you this morning. So let's just pray before we go in. Dear Lord, we thank you that we can study uh, your guidance to how to live our lives today. And we pray, Lord, that if there are lessons that you want us to learn, would you speak into our hearts, we ask, and change us for the better. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So today we're going to be continuing working through the Beatitudes. We've been looking at the Lord's Prayer. And so I'm just going to start. It's from Matthew chapter six and we're working from verses nine to 13 through. So let me just start by reading the Lord's Prayer. If you want to join in as well, you're welcome to do so. Just join along with me. But it's just really important to take in those beautiful words this morning. This is how you should pray, said Jesus. Our Father in heaven hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And the people of God, they said, Amen. Amen. Now, it's also important as well to say that at the end of the Lord's Prayer, the Lord Jesus also came back to a particular phrase. We mentioned about forgive us our debts, and that's where we're focusing today, is on verse 12. And forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. I just want you to listen to what Jesus also said in verse 14, because he comes back to it, about this whole thing about forgiving other people. For if you forgive other people, said Jesus in verse 14, when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. Now, I want to share with you that uh, yesterday uh, was a very important day in that Prince Philip's funeral was held and millions of people around in this country and around the world watched that funeral take place. And I want to share with you a introduction of a story about a member of a royal family, because the truth is, as we've seen, even the royal family, sometimes it's not happy families. Sometimes there are areas where they need to forgive each other. Well, some of you may recall that Princess Diana died in a tragic car accident. I think it was in 1997. And the mother of Princess Diana was called Lady Spencer. Now, the truth is that Lady Spencer battled a lot of problems in her life, including with alcohol and alcoholism. But just a few years before Diana's death, Lady Spencer came to know Jesus Christ as her saviour, and she began to grow in the Lord. And just like we do at Ridgeway, her pastor one time used to ask her to participate in the service, sometimes to do a prayer, sometimes to do a reading. But one Sunday, she noticed that the prayer for the day was actually praying for the royal family. And you might recall that after the death of Diana, there was a lot of difficulty and sorrow and grief, areas maybe they felt they needed to forgive each other animosity between Diana's family and the royal family and so this was a real test for her but what she did is she did read the prayers for the royal family and she prayed for those 
who many would have said were actually against her at that time. But as she prayed, the report said she wept because she knew that she had forgiven them. And that was a big milestone in her life. Lady Spencer had to forgive those people that she felt maybe had hurt her. And that was big and she cried. Now, I think that forgiving other people who have hurt us is a very important spiritual issue. And some people never get past it. And the trouble is it ends up crippling their spiritual life. And the truth is, if you read up on it as well, unforgiveness can lead to anxiety, can lead to depression and even physical ailments. People are literally crippled sometimes because they cannot forgive and move on. And that's why Jesus took time aside here in the Sermon on the Mount to address the importance of forgiving others. And I just want to start by saying this today. Think of Lady Spencer. Don't let unforgiveness cripple your spiritual life and your daily joy. Please don't let unforgiveness cripple your spiritual life and your daily joy. Well, I've just got a few things that I want to share from that passage. And the first point is this. I've entitled it Sins, Debts and Trespasses. And um, we sometimes say in the passage and forgive us our debts. But depending on the tradition that you might come from, if we were to have a church service and we were all saying the Lord's Prayer together, depending on the church background that you have come from, things usually go pretty smoothly until we get to the fourth line. And some say, forgive us our debts. Some say our trespasses and some say sins. It depends on the Bible that version that you're reading. And it also depends on the tradition. Well, it might just be helpful to unpack a little bit about why there are those differences. Firstly, is to say that if one is from an Anglican or a Methodist background, then you'll often find the word trespasses. So I know that my father was a Methodist minister, so I grew up with trespasses. And that actually goes back to the version of the Bible in English that was produced by William Tyndale and also went into the Book of Common Prayer. But if you then go to the King James Version, or you've got a Presbyterian background, then actually you will see that it talks about debts and debtors. And actually, after William Tyndale, back in 1611, it actually reverted back to debts. If you open a more modern Bible up, maybe that you've uh, been joined in a modern Bible, an NLT, then the late 20th century liturgy started to introduce the word sins. So you've got sins, you've got debts and trespasses. So, hey, where should we go on this? Well, actually, all are really helpful. All are really helpful. In Matthew, the Greek words, if we look at it, which I may pronounce incorrectly, but I will do my best, is ophilema. And that means debts or debtors. If we go back to source, that's what it actually means. In Luke, Jesus says, forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. So if you look at the Luke version of the Lord's Prayer, it says it uses the Greek word for sins, which is hamartia, which means sins or guilt. But notice that the second word is paired again with that same word that we just mentioned, which is indebted to us. So it's very important that we get that full meaning. Now, importantly, although it talks about debts, this is not purely or focused really about money. It is not only to debts that are owed us, although that was an important thing that we need to come out of this from Jesus' time, was that actually when he was preaching this, there was an element of actually forgiving people who actually did owe you money. But it's really important that we consider all three of these. And so can I just encourage you, Sometimes I've found that when I read a version of the Bible, I can go through it and I maybe do it very quickly. I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes you do it. You've been doing it so many times that you read it and you don't think about the words as you should. Sometimes picking up an older version of the Bible, like a King James or another version of the Bible, it makes us think afresh. So I find sometimes that 
I can say, forgive me my sins. But when I actually say, forgive me my trespasses, as I forgive those who trespass against us, it actually helps me to think, to stop, to try and understand what that really means. So all three, sins, debts and trespasses, all allow us to properly reflect about what this line means. So don't discount old language or old Bibles. But it's more than just about financial debts. It's about forgiving those that have offended us. It's about forgiving those that have offended us. So let me just think about this for a moment and share this with you. What about our own sins and trespasses? What about us? What about our debts? What about our sins? What about our trespasses? Because we've not merely borrowed from God an unpayable debt for which we appeal for bankruptcy protection. If you think about it, we have sought to seize a realm and to exercise a right that actually belongs to God. And that goes right back to the Garden of Eden, where Adam and Eve sought things that were not rightly theirs. They sought to trespass to take from God that which he said was not for them. And when we think about our own sins and trespasses, I'm reminded of Matthew chapter 7, which follows this immediate passage. And I love this one, and I have to think about this a lot. First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will clearly see to remove the speck from your brother's and sister's eye. Really important, isn't it, that when we go into prayer, we ask God to reveal to us the things in our own life that are wrong. Before we can actually say to the Lord, can you fix these things in other people? Um, we actually need to pray, Lord, would you help me? If there are things in my life that are wrong, the planks in my own eye, Lord, there are sins that I need to come to you today and say sorry for if I am to be praying for other people. So as said, and maybe this sounds a strong word, we have violated God. We have committed a, a treasonous trespass in the Garden of Eden. We trespassed and we owe or should owe the debt of treason, which would be death. It says this in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, praise God, is eternal life in Jesus Christ. Our Lord, we should pay a penalty of death, but through Jesus, we have eternal life. The debt is paid. The debt is paid. When we put our hand in Jesus's and say sorry and ask him to come into our life, then for those of us who trust in him, the terrible debt is completely paid off. The credit card is is ripped up and torn away. The overdraft is gone. The creditor's letters are gone. We are free and we are free indeed. God calls us to forgive others, but we need to recognize that he has forgiven us much worse. He's requiring of us to forgive others who maybe have trespassed into our situation, who have hurt us, and have exercised a right that belongs to us. But since we have been forgiven a far worse violation, surely we can find in our hearts to forgive them. It's really important as well. Sometimes it's a thing in modern life people can struggle with. I sometimes meet people who say, David, I haven't sinned. I, I've been a good person. We've all fallen short. Romans 3.23 says this. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the truth is, we do wrong stuff every day. We try not to, we try and do good. But the truth is, this side of heaven, we do wrong things every day. And it's really important that when we go to the Lord's Prayer, we recognise our sins and recognise that we've all fallen short of the glory of God. Thirdly, just moving through into this passage, I want you to look at that and think about it. Notice that it says, forgive us our sins. Did you notice that? It doesn't say, forgive us my sin. 
it says, forgive us our sins. And when we read this daily prayer, the Lord's Prayer, it's important as well, and Jesus has been quite specific on it. He wants us to remember that it's not as being selfish and just about me, me, me. He's actually saying that when you do this act of prayer, it's really important that we remember that we are part of God's whole global worldwide family of believers. We've no right to ask anything for ourselves that would harm any other family member. And if we are praying in the will of God, the answer will be a blessing to all of God's people. It's important that we put God's concerns first and then we can bring our own needs. Well, here's a question for you. God is concerned about our needs and we know in Matthew 6, 8 that he even knows them before we mention them. So why pray? Well, the answer is simple, because prayer is the God appointed way to have those needs met. Our Heavenly Father wants us to ask, and you can see more of that in James 4, 1 to 3. We need to come before the Lord and petition him and bring all manners of pleas to him. Now, let's reflect about praying that prayer for our sins. And I just want to give you some Old Testament passages about this. As many of you know, one of my favourite books is the book of Daniel. And in Daniel, we read this. Daniel is praying and it says this. So I turned to the Lord God in chapter five of Daniel and I pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned and done wrong. We have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. Will you and I, will we stand in the gap? Will we pray for the people of Didcot? Will we say we have sinned, Lord, in this country? We are sorry. Will you help us? Will you forgive our nation? Will you help us? It, we cry out not just for ourselves. We cry out for our nation. In Job. What a lovely dad I think he must have been. And it says this, when a period of feasting had run its course, Job would make arrangements for them to be purified. And this is the care he had for his children. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of his children, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. And this was Job's regular custom to pray for his children that they would be forgiven. And so we need to pray for our family members for forgiveness for them and that God would bless them and meet them in a special way. So it's wonderful, isn't it, to just share those passages and to talk that through about how the Lord wants to forgive us. Um, in this passage in the Bible as well, it's the Lord's Prayer. And it starts at the beginning, if you remember, and it says, give us today our daily bread. Forgive us to give us today our daily bread. And we need to come in a daily manner, not just to ask for bread, but to ask for forgiveness on a daily basis. Now, I just need to clarify this because you might say, David, are you saying actually that every day we need to be saved again? Well, there are two types of forgiveness we can experience from God. First, let me be quite clear. There is the once and forever kind of forgiveness we receive when we come and confess our sins to the Lord. And we say, I believe in Jesus Christ as my savior. I want to commit my life to the Lord and for my sins to be forgiven. And I believe in what Jesus did on the cross. And that's sometimes called getting saved. Now, there is a sense in that moment you are saved, you're forgiven for every sin, past, present and future. It's a once and for all prayer of salvation. When we are saved, we are washed by Jesus. And as 1 John 1 says, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Hallelujah. All sin. OK, when we come to the Lord. So it's not like every day, oh dear, it's Groundhog Day, I've got to be saved again. There is a once and for all sense that we are saved when we come to Jesus. So you need to know that assurance. 
But secondly, there is the everyday forgiveness which we seek for our daily sins. So we've said when we're saved, it's once and for all. But does that mean that we suddenly stop sinning? When I was baptized, did that mean the day after that I stopped sinning? No, none of us is going to be perfect until we get to heaven. And so the truth is we commit sins every day. Let's be honest. We all do it. We all sin. Now, those sins of themselves do not mean that we have lost our salvation. But if I give you an analogy of this, if there is an argument in a family or between loved ones, it doesn't mean that I'm no longer in that family. But actually, if I've had an argument with somebody in a family situation and we've not said sorry to us, that relationship is negatively impact. Would you agree? It's a difficult time. It's tense. There's angst. There's grief. The relationship is not on a good level. Now, Jesus says to us, it's good that we confess our sins to the Lord every day, not so that we'd be saved again every day, but what it does is it clears out the clouds of sin that would separate us and that would impact our relationship with our Heavenly Father. And I want to have a good relationship with my Heavenly Father. And so in the morning, if I can clear the decks out and we're good with each other, then we can have a good day together. So we're praying daily so that we would have a clean account with God and that we would enjoy fellowship with him. And before we can pray for others or situations, we have to come and say, Lord, would you forgive us? Would you help us so that we can move on ahead? Forgive and we will be forgiven. We'll look at the passage below. Jesus adds an appendix, if you like, to the Lord's Prayer. He says this, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. Now, really important. He was not teaching that we earn forgiveness by forgiving others. We have just shared. We've shared about the grace and the mercy of God through Christ Jesus, not through works, but through faith. We are saved. We also heard Joy share the parable of the unmerciful servant, and it's very powerful. But we do know that to have fellowship, we need fellowship with my brother and sister. We need to pray for forgiveness. We cannot possibly walk with God in true fellowship if we true refuse to forgive others. Prayer involves glorifying God's name and seeking his kingdom. Imagine this. Imagine I came to pray to the Lord and I'd, I'd got some hard stuff against other people. I had an unforgiving spirit. Now, if the Lord was to answer my prayers, it would be potentially to dishonor his own name because he would be encouraging sin and endorsing it, the fact that I was coming and asking prayer without actually having a right heart before him. So the important thing about prayer is not simply getting an answer back from God. But when we pray as well, we are seeking to be the kind of person that God can trust with the answer. We pray for forgiveness, that we might be the kind of big hearted people that God can trust with the answer. Let's just wrap up a few things now. So let me just wrap up a few things I shared with you today. There were five things just to run through, and I just want to refresh through them. The first one is this. We spoke about sins, debts, and trespasses. Three words that are used in different translations of the Lord's Prayer for that passage. And I just wanted to emphasize that it's more than financial debts. It's about those that have trespassed against us, those who have offended us. But sins, debts, and trespasses all have a richness in language that can help us to think. We need to recognize our own sin before we go in to pray for other things, for we have all fallen short. Forgive us our sins. It's about praying for our family, our friends, the church and the nation. The Lord's Prayer is not just about me, me, me. We are praying that the Lord would give, forgive us our sins. 
We spoke about the important daily act of transformation. We pray for, for forgive us, Lord, our daily bread. And we also pray, dear Lord, would you forgive us any sins that we've done in the last day that we need to be right hearted with you? Will you forgive us, Lord, for those sins? Because we want a right daily walk with you and we want a cleaner account. We don't want any argument with you, Lord. We want to be open before you and forgive and we will be forgiven. It's not about faith and works because that was done through Jesus Christ. But the Lord is seeking people who will forgive others so that we can be big hearted people that God can trust with the answer and that we might be agents of change in our communities. Don't let unforgiveness cripple yours and my spiritual life and joy. Please don't. Let unforgiveness cripple your life and joy. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for the privilege that we can come in daily prayer, confess our sins, take the planks out of our own eye, and actually then walk afresh with you and have a great relationship with you. Lord, we don't want to be crippled by unforgiveness. And maybe as I'm praying today, there are people that say, David, you don't know how much somebody hurt me. You don't know how much they really damaged me. You don't know the trauma that I had. And the answer is I don't. But I pray, dear Lord, for those individuals that they could at least bring that to you and ask that you would enable them to forgive. And so, Lord, I do pray for each of us. Lord, if there are areas of life where we need to forgive people, I pray that you bring it to my attention and to my friends in the church attention, into the church family's attention so that we could have a really great relationship with you and go forward with you, Lord. Walk with you every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, Lawrence, one of the nice things here, Lawrence, is, is I get some, the, the preacher sometimes gets to ping, pick a song. Yes. So I just thought only the best, Lawrence. We're going to go tip top this morning. <laughs> so um, this is... Uh, the Lord's Prayer, and it's it's sung in just a, a such a beautiful way. And I always find it amazing as well. It always touches my heart because, as you'll know, when you see the individual concerned, he's blind from birth, and when he sings, it always touches my heart. So I hope it blesses everybody else too, Lawrence. Okay, thank you, David. Thank you so much for today's word. Um, I've learned a lot. There's a lot of gems. Like you've actually really dissected, and I really um thankful for, for what you've done. It's been a very interesting sermon. God bless you. And, and before we play the song, David, I, I left out one announcement. So I'm going to let um, um, Johan play that announcement and then we will play the song. Uh, but thank you so much for the sermon, David. God bless you. Hello, we wanted to give you an update of what's happening over the next few weeks and months. As we all know, coronavirus hit last year that's not something that any of us expected and the first thing that happened of course is that physical gatherings in church buildings stopped but praise god the government norovirus can stop the church being the church so the first thing that we did is we reassembled on zoom and we worked really really hard to make sure that our gatherings are not just other people watching in, but give each and every one of us the opportunity to be involved and to participate. And so praise God as we gather together, numbers have remained consistent and people tell us that they continue to be blessed and encouraged by those gatherings. But of course, things are changing. So what does the future look like? Well, we know that the future will have a few twists and turns and a few ups and a few downs. We've been looking at the government's roadmap out of lockdown and we see that between steps three and four, there are five weeks between the 26th of May and the 20th of June. And we've thought and prayed long and hard what to do. We don't simply want to open the church buildings in order that 30, 35 people can gather and other people watch. We want to do something that is authentic and genuine and involves each and every one of us. So we are going to be having Sunday morning 
garden clusters. We believe that each church, Wallingford and Didcot, can be broken down into about six different garden clusters, each with 15 to 20 people in. And we want those people to gather for coffee and for croissants, for fellowship, for fun. We want you to be able to pray and testify, to have a short message and to discuss God's word together. But that is not all because we know that that's still a few weeks away and some people want to gather physically and they want to gather as soon as possible. So we're going to be opening up the Ridgeway Centre starting from Sunday the 2nd of May and we're going to be meeting there physically. As in the past, it's going to be a booking system that we will use. All of the information will be sent out to you in due course. Now initially what we're going to be doing is simply in-house. We will meet together, we'll pray together, we'll worship together, we'll share communion together. But once the garden clusters start, this is going to be a live stream where there's going to be some substantial teaching. And so we do want to encourage you not just to gather physically in the gardens, but consider coming in the evening. And if you're not confident or you're not able to do that, certainly meet with us online or catch up throughout the week. And I think that that is all. Goodbye and God bless. If you like what you heard, there are ways to connect to Ridgeway Community Church. You can connect by our website at www.ridgewaycommunity.church or drop us a message via chris at ridgewaycommunity.church. You can also join our virtual Sunday Zoom service at 10.30am. If you have teenagers in years 7 to 11, they can also connect with our youth ministry. For more information, please drop us a message with details provided. We would love to hear from you. Many blessings from Ridgeway Community Church, Didcot.